All right, welcome back to Theology Applied. I am your host, Pastor Joel Webin with Right Response Ministries, and today is the third and final part of our mini three-part series focusing exclusively on Eastern Orthodoxy. Part one, if you weren't there for it, go back, check it out. Part one, we focused on three deadly heresies committed by Eastern Orthodoxy. Last week was part two, and we drew out the distinctions between Eastern Orthodoxy versus Roman Catholicism, both similar in many ways, both heretical in many ways, but both nonetheless have important distinctions that Protestants need to understand as we engage both of these two major religions. That was part two last week. Today, what you're watching right now is the third and final part of this mini-series on Eastern Orthodoxy, and our topic for today is focusing on three of the primary reasons why certain Reformed Protestants are switching teams to EO. Right now, and I would argue that this has actually even increased and exponentially begun to ramp up, right now in recent years, there are Protestant Reformed pastors, even ministers, who have switched from the Protestant faith to Eastern Orthodoxy. A deadly mistake, the wrong direction, but it keeps happening. And I think there's three primary reasons why who I have invited to help me in this journey is Joshua Shooping. Joshua Shooping is a Protestant Reformed minister, but in the past, for five years, he served as an Eastern Orthodox priest. He's highly experienced and knowledgeable on the topic. He'll be joining me for all three parts, including today's episode on Theology Applied. Tune in now. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You're going to want to hear this. Our next two conferences are coming up quick. We've got first our fall conference. This is November 11th and 12th. That's a full day Saturday and a holdover for the Lord's Day, November 12th. Uh, Who's speaking at this conference? Well, we've got Jared Longshore and Chris Wiley and yours truly, Pastor Joel Webbin. What's the title? The title is The Household and the War for the Cosmos. Now, I know you're thinking, wait a second, you can't use that title, Joel. That's the title for Chris Wiley's book. Well, I can use it because he's going to be there speaking and he gave me his permission. We're going to be talking about the household as the basic building block for pushing back the kingdom of darkness in this world. We're going to be talking about biblical patriarchy. We're going to be talking about marriage and parenting parenting, how to keep your kids, how to shape and form them like straight arrows, like sharp arrows that do damage to the kingdom of darkness, training our children in the fear and admonition of the Lord. A full day on Saturday, November 11th, and then holding Jared Longshore over for the Lord's Day, November 12th, to preach at my church, Covenant Bible Church, in Central Texas. You can register at the early bird rate, which will not last long, but you can register at the early bird rate today by going to rightresponseconference.com. Again, that's rightresponseconference.com. Now, our second conference is our spring conference. This is Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, March 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. The title for this conference, Blueprints for Christendom 2.0. Blueprints for Christendom 2.0. We don't want to revert back to Christendom 1.0, although it would certainly be a whole lot better than the clown world that we're currently living in. But we recognize, despite the phenomenal features of a prior Christendom, there were certain bugs that we'd like to see worked out. So we're not going back. We are pushing forward to Christendom 2.0. We believe that the blueprints are seven doctrines for ruling the world righteously. What are these seven doctrines? Well, it's reformed confessionalism. It's covenant theology. It's biblical patriarchy. It's presuppositionalism and Kuyperianism and general equity theonomy and hopeful eschatology post-millennialism. Who's going to be teaching us on these doctrines? Voldemort. 
he who must not be named, Pastor Douglas Wilson himself. You also got Mr. Bright Hearth, Mr. Kings Hall, Mr. Haunted Cosmos, Pastor Brian Sauve. And we also have Dr. Joseph Boot and, of course, yours truly, Pastor Joel Webbin. We'll be doing seven primary lectures as well as two 90-minute panels with all the speakers together, and we'll likely add a couple more speakers along the way. Again, that's March 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. It's Blueprints for Christendom 2.0. We've got the early bird rate going right now, but it will run out quickly. So go to rightresponseconference.com, rightresponseconference.com to register today. I wanted to ask you the question. I'll give you, you know, I'll show my hand up front, but why, why the infatuation? You know, like whether it be with Rome or especially, I think, Eastern Orthodoxy right now, you know, hearing stories of this guy, you know, you know, converted over to Eastern Orthodoxy. And I think part of it is as, as things have become so uncertain with COVID, right? And, and with, you know, and you know, we have civil tyranny and you have all these in that you can't trust every major institution has discredited itself. Um, and, and, you know, whether it be the media or academia or, or um, government or wh whatever it might be, um, and I think a lot of people feel betrayed. A lot of people don't know where, what is true, what's stable, what's secure, what, what can they trust? And so when somebody purports themselves to say, we haven't changed in 2000 years, which is a joke, you know, that, that's not true of Roman Catholicism wow. that, you know, this Vatican overrides that Vatican, this Pope overrides that Pope, this uh, priest doesn't agree with that priest, you know, it's a joke. But if you can convince people that that's true. We haven't changed. We've been steady as she goes, rock solid for 2,000 years with a united front across the board. Um, no, that's not true. But if you can make people think that's true in a society, in a culture that, that is uh, in disarray with so much instability and people are desperate for what is true, and then you walk in the building and to, and to go along with this, this rhetoric, this narrative of we haven't ever changed and never will, you also have, you know, glorious images and everything looks so offensive, old, big Bible and, and long robes and tassels and candles and this and the architecture and everything just looks so old and so trusted and, and so impressive. Holy, impressive. Exactly. And pe people are like, they fall for it. Whereas, you know, you walk into my church, we meet at Dale's Essenhaus. Dale's Essenhaus. It's a beer garden. It's uh, we meet in their little uh, country line dancing, you know, studio. We have, you know, 200 people in there. Um, I, you know, I'm preaching behind, you know, a, a, it's a pulpit, but it's, it's a makeshift pulpit. You know, we've got people sitting in metal chairs um, and, and it's just, it's just the Bible. It's just what's central is not a table. Um, it's, it's not um, an icon. It's not a candle. It's not incense. Um, what's front and center is it's the word and it's faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. It's not seen as just word, 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 preach, preach, preach. And, and that's it. And I think people are like, and I, it's underwhelming. It's very underwhelming to walk into a, a simplistic, regular principle, reformed Puritan type church. And it's just a few chairs and a Bible um, and, and a preacher opening up the scripture and giving the sense of the meeting, like in, in you know, Ezra and Nehemiah. And, and so I think that that's um, to people that just feels like that can't be it. It's got to be more. That that can't be it. It's got to be more than this. So I think stability is showing my hand. I think that's one of the reasons why people are going into Easter or Orthodoxy um, out of um, pro Reformed Protestant theology. But I can think of a couple other reasons. But before I mention them, what do, what do you think is the appeal? Why are guys? Because you know some of these guys. They're they're making the switch. They're going the wrong direction, the opposite direction that you came. Why? What's the appeal? Yeah, um, I think you were really onto it um, with this notion of stability. I think people, I think we're all sort of sensing the decay of Western civilization. Um, you know, uh, Europe is a few years ahead of us uh, in some ways. Um, and so I think the, uh, that, that question of what survived longer than my church that put up its, you know, hung its, hung its shingle about five year, 50 years ago. Right. You know, um, I want to know something that's lo older than America. What's some like America's going to fall? America's going to collapse. Um, America isn't the gospel anymore. Um, and so I think that notion of stability, 
Um, but in relation to this kind of like rapid decay of culture, the rapid decay of, of our civilization, like you mentioned, like politics and, and like the whole mess of it, uh, it seems terrible. Um, I also think, um, I think the aesthetics are impressive and we're a very impressionistic people today. Uh, we don't necessarily really follow theological arguments uh, all that well <laughs> sometimes as, as people. Um, I think mm -hmm. a few do and a few are trained to do so, but a lot of people just church hop, just church shop. So for a lot mm -hmm. of converts into Eastern Orthodoxy, it's just like a, a total aesthetic. It's, mm -hmm. it's an answer to the decay of civilization that provides guidance where they don't have any. It tells them when to fast and when not to fast because they don't know how to live. It tells them which right. scriptures to read. So I don't just make up my own Bible reading plan. I, I'm reading together with the church. There's a, a greater sense of unity. Um, it tells me, uh, I mentioned fasting, the church year also, it, you know, uh, which, which feasts to celebrate. Um, we also believe in beauty. So we build beautiful buildings or we try to, we try to make things beautiful. And I think there's a place for aesthetics in, uh, yeah. uh according Protestants to Protestants need to be better at that. Yeah. I, I, yeah. You know, Angels in the Architecture is a good book. Like that, you know, there is something to be said for high vaulted ceilings speaking to the transcendence of God. These kinds of, and building things to last. I think part of the reason why Protestants haven't done that recently is, well, in the case of Rome, um, it takes money, and it always helps when you got indulgence money. You know, that that's that's multiplied over five hundred years. That's like that's some good. That's that's some good cash. So they're always going to have more money uh, when you when you you know told people they were going, uh, you know, their loved ones were going to stay in purgatory unless they, you know, a coin in the coffer clinks, you know, soul and purgatory spring. So that's a, uh, when you got 500 year old money that's been working for you with interest, <laughs> you know, where you scared people, scared the hell out of them, then, you know, Rome is going to just have more cash to build those nicer buildings than Protestants. But also aside from corruption and, and stealing money from the poor, um, I also think that Protestants have embraced, in large part, Western Protestants have embraced dispensational premillennialism. So why build a glorious, transcendent, you know, beautiful, aesthetic building uh, if Jesus is coming back next Thursday? I yeah. think that's part of it too. So I'd anyways, rather back him to find us building. Uh, Me too. Sitting Amen. on our hands, right? <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Right. Um, so I, I think that that is a good thing. I think it could even be dovetailed into the notion of uh, theonomy. And I know that you uh, affirm a post-millennial position. I think that that right. is a part of that. I think that that, that has a really good place there. Uh, it fits really well, but I would even say that that it should fit in an amillennial position. We know that, that that's consistent with, you know, the Roman Catholic right. and the Eastern Orthodox with their more amillennial position. But I would say even a premillennial position uh, should still try to build things to last because we don't know when Jesus is coming. And he may come know. tomorrow, but I think he should find us building. He should find us praying. He should find us laboring for the kingdom, you know. Um, and those aren't, uh, those aren't bad things. Um, but, yeah, I think that's one of the, the, the big reasons why people leave because I think when we don't invest in where we're at, it doesn't look like we're invested where we're at. It looks like, well, we could just pick up shop and leave tomorrow and, you know, and, and none of it really mattered. Um, but right. I think the things that we do and the things that we build now matter, just like we, we, we write thousand page systematic theology textbooks or four volume systematic theology textbooks. Um, I think architects could do the equivalent with building, you know, mm -hmm. uh, why not? Let's, I mean, they, they, they take years and years of study and research to, to write these brilliant texts like, uh, Herman Bavink, you know, or, or Richard Muller doing his study of Protestant scholasticism or, or William Shedd or, or whoever it is that we have uh, that we go back and study. I, I think that, that just as we do intellectual work in that area, I think we could do great, beautiful architecture that competes with the ugly architecture of our, you know, uh, you know, contemporary postmodern America. Amen. Well said. Um, yeah. But, and that's the all of Christ, all of life. I think part of the reason we don't do that is because of the secular sacred divine. And that, that Protestants, I, th I think Protestants, well, uh, all of us, you know, uh, but, but Protestants, I think, you know, part of it is just, um, this is, you know, th this isn't eternal. This isn't going to last. What's going to last is the word of, you know, the word of God endures forever. And so, you know, so it's worth the theology book, um, that's expounding upon the word of God in the text. Um, but the, you know, the building, the material, you know, that's, it's just, it's vain, it's vanity. It's, and, and I, and I would disagree. Um, so I think whether it's, you know, 
uh, building a church cathedral or whether it's starting a business uh, with your family what and all these things all of Christ for all of life um, every you know we want every good work um, to you know to to put our heart and soul in everything that we have to do our work is unto the Lord uh, the, the last reason that I thought of was so one stability one aesthetic so we're saying you know people making the switch out of Protestant faith into EO or Roman Catholicism because the aesthetic and and a big one because of the at least the appearance of stability and you know being able to say we have a 2000 year old history that's never changed the third one that i could think of is uh a lot of protestant pastors are gay and i mean like <laughs> some are literally gay they are homosexuals and then others of them um they don't they don't go to bed like a homosexual but they get out of bed and walk around and talk like a homosexual they are effeminate as, mm -hmm. as the scripture would say that, you know, there is the sin of homosexuality, but then there's also effeminacy, right? That soft, soft clothing, right? For, uh, as John the Baptist, you know, what, what did you, you know, Jesus says, what did you go out in the wilderness to see a man in soft clothing, you know, men like that, they, you know, those are, those are, uh, princes. And I, and I would argue with that, that I think Jesus is making fun of the civil magistrate that like that, uh, the governing official, he's, uh, he's the one who's soft, right? Like that, yeah. that's, uh, you want to, you want a man in soft clothing, uh, go to the white house, check out Biden. Right. But, uh, but if you want, if you want a man who's wearing camel skin and eating locusts, like a man's man, masculine, uh, then, then you go and find a preacher. Then you go and find John the Baptist. But when preachers in Protestantism um, are just like politicians and just like any other effeminate man, he's, you, you can't count on him to keep his word. Um, he's going to tickle ears. He's going to tell people what they want to hear. He won't take a stand. The government comes knocking and says, shut down your church. And he says, for how long, Caesar? You know, and, and they say, wear a mask. And he's like, can I wear two, Caesar? You know, get a, get a jab to love your neighbor. Can, how about four, Caesar? Like That's the second mile. The, yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. And they're using that kind of, you know, argumentation, which is not what Jesus was saying. Then, then people, and then they see some EO guy. And again, it could just be the aesthetics. We've talked about the aesthetics of the cathedral, the building, but also let's talk about the, the aesthetics of, of the priest. Um, you see an EO guy and he's wearing black robes and a big chain cross and he's got a beard and you think, oh, finally I could have a pastor that's a male for once in my life. Like, sure. Like, like my pastor has, I'm pretty sure he has an XY chromosome, but I can't be really sure that my pastor is a male. Right. Exactly. Is he a male? I don't know where, but I can, this guy actually is a dude and I'd like to have a pastor who's a dude for once. So I think it's the aesthetics. I think it's the sense of stability um, and unity, but I think it's also the, the masculinity guys are leaving reformed Protestant theology because it's like, well, I've got Tim Keller on one hand, or I've got Moses the fourth with a beard down to his belly button. And he's like, when he's not studying to preach, he's, he's benching 350, you know, like, and that's, that's what, you know, there's some EO guys like that. Maybe not all of them, but that's the image that guys have. And they're like, yeah, I'll go to, I'll go to his church. Do you think that that's maybe a thing, the masculine piece? Yeah, I think, uh, was it Vadi Bakum who mentioned the 11th commandment, thou shalt be nice. Right. Um, yeah. You know, or thou shalt not be ni uh, not nice kind of thing. <laughs> and it's uh, I think we confuse um, like being patient, uh, kind, gentle, these fruits of the spirit with effeminacy, weakness, wishy washiness, um, where we nuance to the point where now we don't have to have a belief, really. Like uh, mm. we don't want anybody to leave our church. So. Uh, you know, we don't preach doctrine that divides, you know, uh, we don't preach against sin or preach repentance um, or preach obedience, you know, um, that's just legalism, you know, and so we've redefined the word legalism uh, to mean any sort of obedience or strictness, you know, and so we sort of lose that masculine quality that wants to stand for st something wants to fight for something, fight for the kingdom. I want to fight for the king. Right. Um, one of my favorite scenes, uh, maybe this, uh, you know, it's silly to say, but uh, in Return of the King, I believe it is when uh, Theoden is standing there and he holds up his sword in front of the whole army and he yells death, you know, mm -hmm. and he's death, death. And then everybody starts screaming death and they just like run to go fight, uh, you know, to, 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 to defend the kingdom. You know? right. We're going to die, but we're going to die gloriously. Yeah. Right. Um, he had black pilled 
And now finally he's like, he's having this realization like, no, nah, if I'm going to go down, right. The, the horn, the horn, uh, and road, <laughs> Rodan yeah. will sound yeah. once more, you know, one final, like, yeah, it's, yeah. It's amazing. Amazing scene. Yeah. And so it's like, now we have, you know, romantic Jesus, we have sweetie Jesus, we have, you know, Jesus in his flip flops and his, you know, shorts and his tank top flipping burgers on 4th of July, mm. Jesus, um, you know, and it's like, we don't have like, like King Jesus, uh, right. Lord Jesus, uh, the one who's going to ride in with a sword on a, uh, on a horseback, you know, and is going to mm. destroy his enemies and right. the, the one that conquers death and, and, and the idea of even well, I think we're along uh, the same page here. You know, this idea of a regained masculinity. Um, our whole entire culture has become one of effeminate belonging uh, yes. in a lot of ways. Uh, but men bond through competition, through pushing against each other. Um, even the notion of brotherly love. How do brothers love each other? They push on each other. They fight and they argue. Right. Um, mm -hmm. You know, but we don't have that. It's it's uh, we, we we get self esteem by being coddled, not by not by uh, being victorious. You know, and, and gaining confidence in our ability and skill and trying our hand at the competition. You know, uh, you know, amongst people who are our friends and allies, but the ones who push us to be great and to be to be our best. You know. Um, but mm -hmm. in a spiritual key, so to speak, you know, so it's just, yeah, it's, uh, I think it's a lot, a loss of that, that masculine spirit that we need to be able to regain. And we see it all over the place, you know, where, you know, now men don't even know if they're men anymore. Women don't know if they're women anymore. They don't even know what gender right. is anymore. Um, and so it's just a profound confusion. So people go to these established forms in an Eastern Orthodox church where very easily there's the man. You right. know, um, and I also think uh, and I don't I don't know if this is the right term for it because I don't believe in clericalism, but I do believe that that the pastor should be the pastor and he should be identifiable. Um, you know, yes. um, you know, in in the past, it would have been, you know, even 75 years ago, it would have been Pastor Webin. Right. It would have been Pastor Shooping, Pastor Smith. Uh, but now it's uh, Josh. Or Joel or Bobby. <laughs> oh, there's Bobby, right. my pastor, you know, uh, mm -hmm. God forbid. Oh, there's Jen Jenny, uh, my pastor, you know, <laughs> right, right. sort of thing. But like this right. idea of hierarchy, that there is uh, authority, constituted authority, and there's hierarchy in the church. Um, yes. We assume that everything has to be egalitarian. Yes. Um. But uh, that's uh, another uh, factor, I think, that comes in to kind of undermine where we don't really respect authority as a culture. I think you're absolutely right. That was really helpful. So the masculinity side, but also the, the hierarchical side, which and those two things are not those aren't even really two separate points. That's if we're talking about masculinity and, and biblical patriarchy, that's that that's right in the vein of, of hierarchy that God made a world right that that um that has order it's not um because really egalitarianism always eventually brings along with it androgyny and hierarchy um always contains in it um a, a celebrated distinction between masculinity and femininity and that that you know biblical patriarchy is inescapable and that is right in line with hierarchy that we live number one god God reveals himself as a father. We live in the father's world. He's the father of lights. Every good and, and, and uh, perfect gift comes down from him. And he works in the father's world. He's baked rules into the very fabric of his creation. Uh, so we have no choice but to live in the father's world according to the father's rules. God will not be mocked. What a man sows, he will reap. And God works, the father of lights, the heavenly father, works predominantly through um, human fathers in each of these various divinely instituted spheres of the home, the church, and the state, that we have familial fathers as the head of the home. We have ecclesiastical spiritual fathers. Elders are men. I would hold also to a male diaconate. So ordained officers in the church are men. And then and then I believe that even outside of just the home and the church, but outside of it in the state as well, uh, that we should have civil fathers, the Christian prince, you know, or whatever form of government that society has, but still they they are predominantly. 
um, male. They may, there may be some, you know, accompanying roles of administrator or something, but, um, but governors and, and satraps and, um, and, you know, rulers and mayors and, and police, and certainly anyone in any form of combat or anyone exercising authority, I believe should be male. And, and when you don't have that, you know, like Isaiah, I think it's Isaiah or maybe Ezekiel that, that speaks about, um, the state, the civil magistrate and describes it in, in, um, with a metaphor with, with, um, with, with a descriptive language like a bear. It, it has like claws and teeth. And, um, at, you know, and then you see women um, in positions of civil authority like Ketanji, you know, uh, Brown Jackson, you know, who recently appointed to the Supreme Court. And one of conservatives, you know, objections was, was she soft on crime? And, and particularly, uh, she's been soft on on pedophiles, right? And, and you, see, you know, you see like with, with you know, with Putin and, and Russia and stuff, you know, some famous uh, political journalist uh, woman, you know, came out and wrote a poem um, about if only I was Putin's mom, right? Well, yeah, that, that is the way that a woman thinks. And, and that's the way that God made a woman to think is, oh, you know, th- this pedophile, um, man, he, he just, he needs a good mom, you know, uh, Putin, you know, a warlord <laughs> needs a good mom. Um, whereas men think um, that pedophile, oh, he needs a good noose. Um, you know, like that's what he, he needs. He needs to be put to death according to the, you know, God's law um, that, you know, and, and, but you need both. We're not, we're not androgynous. We're not supposed to be the same. Women are caring. They're nurturing. I mean, from their physical stature, the way that they're built in every regard from their disposition emotionally to their physical stature, to their role in society um, is to nurture, to love, to develop, to build. Um, and men, it's, it's to, it's to rule. It's, it's to fight. It's, it's conquest. It's, and, um, and we've lost, we, we've completely lost that. So whether we're talking about masculinity that, you know, yeah, if some church purports to be the same for the last 2000 years without any change and it's masculine, uh, you walk in, you know who the dudes are you, you, and, and, and it's also has a hierarchical order and organization and respect for those in authority. Um, and those in the past in authority, church fathers and these guys, then it's like, as, as much as our society is feministic and egalitarian and androgynous, um, people, it, as our society becomes more progressive in those ways, I think it's driving more and more people right into the arms of what appears to, to be the antithesis to those things. It's a healthy Masculine, instinct jumping into a bad it place. It is a healthy instinct. Yeah, yeah. That's, what I, that's what I'm saying. And I don't think that's the answer. I don't think Eastern Orthodoxy or Roman Catholicism is the answer, but it appears it has the, a masculine veneer. And it takes uh, it about has, five yeah. years or so for all of the <laughs> internal division to really start to be noticeable uh, to people mm. entering into these churches. Uh, so for the first five years, it's like I'm disoriented. Now I'm getting oriented. And now I'm figuring out where I fit in. But now I notice that other people have different opinions. And so, you know, you had have the famous Callistos Ware, who's a famous apolo- was a famous uh, famous apologist for the Eastern Orthodox Church. He was uh, heading up a, a, a pro dia- uh, female diaconate um, mm. society, like he was advocating for that wow. there. And so, hmm. kind of a uh, uh, an interesting little tidbit that a lot of people don't know about him. Um, but I would say in terms of that, also that hierarchy um, and relational nature of life is is baked into the fifth commandment. I think that, you know, the idea that we're to honor our father and our mother, I mean, like the underlying presupposition of that is that life is relational, but life is hierarchical, yes. you know, and the father was the, the priest of the home, so to speak, you know, so they didn't have that arbitrary, secular, sacred divide, you know, right. uh, the way that we do. So, you know, I, I, I think that that we see this loss of the hierarchy, you know, but we have relation. So, but relation with a hierarchy ends up becoming that kind of effeminate sort of culture uh, where Mm -hmm. men aren't allowed to fight really. Uh, Men aren't allowed to protect and compete and we outsource all of that. And so what's left for them to do? Well, I guess we'll be like a woman. Yep. Mm Mm-hmm. I think you're absolutely right. Well, I th- this has been really helpful for me. I think our listeners are really going to appreciate it. I want to give you the final word, um, Pastor Shooping. <laughs> uh, well, you know, it, it came me with the point made earlier. You're right. I think it's, I think it's good to, to show that kind of respect, but could you give us, um, what, what just, I don't know, anything you want to leave us with our listeners. I'm, I'm sure some, you know, I've, I've done one video on Eastern Orthodoxy 
and I, and I flew solo for that one. And I just made a few just general points, things that, that I was aware with, not near the specificity that we've gone into today. So I think this will be a very helpful follow-up. But the, the general one that I did got a lot of guys who, um, not a lot of Protestants necessarily trying to find out about Eastern Orthodoxy, but a lot of Eastern Orthodoxy guys watching the video and, and getting upset. So I, I, I have no doubt you're going to have a lot of guys who are Eastern Orthodoxy watching this. Maybe the final word, rather than to the Protestant, maybe the final word could go to them. Um, do you have anything to say to them? Um, you know, I, I often try to leave Eastern Orthodox people alone and, and speak uh, to Protestants, and even when people get to the point where they're uh, leaving Protestantism and they kind of in their heart turn that corner, you know, uh, to become Eastern Orthodox, like I find that that kind of like psychological leap is really profound. And there's really very little that can be said other than I, I, I wish them well, um, but I would maybe only reiterate uh, the concept of the canonical argument uh, where a person needs to actually go and look at the formally approved official documents and official theology or, uh, or and the pillar saints whose theology informed some of these councils. So like John of Damascus with icons, I think it's a phony argument that he gives. It's very, uh, it's a sophistry. But then also Gregory Palamas, uh, his theology got involved into their idea of hesychasm, their idea of stillness. But he actually turns in his theology, in his second sermon or second homily on the feast of Mary's entrance into the table, uh, into the temple, they literally believe, and at the level of their hymns and their formal theology, that she lived in the Holy of Holies from the time she was three years old and was fed by angels. That's Mary? a formal, factual <laughs> belief that they hold to. Um, that sounds like something they got from Muhammad or something. You know, that's something, you know, what you would expect to find in the Quran, right? Because you find some of those common Christian heresies, you know, that, you know, Muhammad was like, he heard this and thought it was true and he picked up on it to, you know, because he's forming his lie in a good life. It's going to be believable, you know, keep some things that are true. But it's anyways, it, so, it sounds like a like a, a Muslim heresy, you know. Yeah, almost. well, they picked it up from, I think it's a third century text that was kind of like a Gnostic text that where the Christians picked up the idea of Mary's ever virginity, um, the right. uh, proto evangelium of James. Um, mm -hmm. And so that text itself was rejected and considered anathema in and of itself at, at, at different points. Um, but anyway, it somehow seeped into the water of the Eastern Orthodox church. But um, I would also add that not only did um Gregory Palamas affirmed that about Mary, but he said that she made like mystical ascents up and down to heaven. What? And that he made that, uh, or he said that Mary made a way to heaven through this ascetical mystical discipline. And that she essentially brought Jesus down to save the world. That, mm. that, that Jesus was almost an instrument in Mary's hand. Wow. And that even today that Mary's become a transcendental saving principle, according to Gregory Palamas, that you can't even approach Jesus unless you go through Mary first. Not just that Jesus came through uh, through Mary and therefore she kind of has like a poetic sense. It's a, There's a poetic sense in which salvation, who is Jesus, came through Mary. They've turned that into like a metaphor for a permanent situation where now she's a transcendental kind of person mm. that we have to go to to get to Jesus. And that's in their official doctrines and official teachings. And if you look in like the Akathist hymn to, to Mary, they sing that she's the propitiation for the world. What? And they, they mean it when you put it together and you see it. Like if you're an evangelical and you go into the Protestant world, you have like so many gospel filters and you just like filter out a lot of nonsense and noise. But when you're in there and you're steeping for a while, you either absorb all the craziness or the craziness starts to appear to you and you leave. But some of that craziness is that they really believe that Mary is a saving principle uh, unless they've been westernized, unless they become mm -hmm. like Americanized Orthodox. And then they 
they kind of become Protestantizing because there was a Protestantizing movement in Russian Orthodoxy going all the way back to the 1700s. They were reading and even teaching in their seminaries either Protestant scholastic textbooks or Roman Catholic like Jesuit type textbooks. Mm -hmm. So there was a huge Western influence where you'll find in Russian Orthodoxy in particular some things that sound kind of good, kind of okay, like, oh, are they teaching you know, penal substitutionary atonement in this author. Um, but that's because they were reading Protestant and, and reformed authors uh, in uh, Russia at the time. And so it really was mm. hugely influential. But so I would say that that's another thing is like, stop listening to what your local priest says and go to the formal documents. Mm. Stop just saying that there's this, this made up orthodox phronema or mindset that's independent from what the ecumenical councils and what the later councils all said, where they anathematize Luther and Lutherans and, and Calvin and Calvinists and, and, and they get rid of the, the gospel uh, by adding faith and works, like all of that stuff, like go to the real, actual, authentic documents and stop listening to what your friendly neighborhood priest says, because... They went to the same seminary I went to, or a, sim a seminary similar, and I can tell you that it's it's uh, it's a jungle out there. The Orthodox mm. don't know what they believe. They just say it's an Orthodox phronema, and we love the fathers, but we don't take what any one father says. So I couldn't really tell you what we really believe, but definitely not penal substitutionary atonement. And it's just like circles like that. Hmm. Really helpful. Uh, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really hope that by God's grace, if if some guys who prescribe to Eastern Orthodoxy are listening to the show, that they would be open, that they would be humble, that they would at least prayerfully consider the arguments that you've made. I think they're compelling. And um, yeah, I appreciate you coming on the show. And for every Protestant that's listening, everybody who follows this channel that uh, would be within the, the Protestant and many of you, you know, Protestant Reformed tradition, um, I think it's helpful for us just to be more educated on this particular subject because uh, it doesn't look like it's going to go away anytime soon. And so I think for us to be aware with uh, what what somebody within Eastern Orthodoxy actually believes, um, what they say they believe, but then what, what the history actually says, what the original documents actually say, so that we can, um, so that we can engage uh, with love and with truth that we can engage uh, for the glory of God and for the good of our neighbors that we want to see um, truly have saving faith in, in the gospel of Jesus Christ, that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, according to the scripture alone, to the glory of God alone. So thank you so much for coming on the show. I think it's been really helpful, and uh, I hope that all of our listeners have been blessed. Thanks for tuning in. My pleasure. Thank you for having me, Joel. Fight by flight. Why leaving godless places is loving godless places. I've had a lot of people tell me recently, Pastor Joel, you're post-millennial. You claim to believe that Jesus is king of every square inch, but apparently you don't think he's king of California because I've heard your personal story that you used to be a pastor there and that you left for the state of Texas. Notice the title, not fight or flight, but fight by flight. Think of the prodigal son. He comes to the end of his rope. He's longing to be fed with the pods given to the pigs. And the parable says no one gave him anything. No member of the father's house tracked him down to give him a handout. He was hurting. He had to lie in the bed that he had made for himself by his foolish choices. You know what the next words in that parable are? No one gave him anything. And he came to his senses. He began to Repent. There are 10 million professing Christians currently living in the state of California. What if they're fighting, but at the same time, while well-intentioned, they're also funding? What if California could be brought to its knees simply by the faithful not fighting there, but leaving there and forcing Gavin Newsom and other tyrants like him to actually have to take a spoonful of their own medicine? The book has been forwarded by Douglas Wilson. It's been endorsed by Michael Foster. It's good to be a man. Also Meg Basham, The Daily Wire, and Steve Dace from The Blaze Network. It's available on Amazon, as well as a cheaper copy that can be purchased right from our website, which is rightresponseministries.com. 